Frankenstein by Mary Shelley Chapter 2 When I had attained the age of seventeen, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, but my father thought it necessary, for the completion of my education, that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date. But before the day resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred, an omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever, but her illness was not severe and she quickly recovered. During her confinement many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her. She had at first yielded to our entreaties, but when she heard that her favorite was recovering, she could no longer debar herself from her society and entered her chamber long before the danger of infection was past. The consequences of this imprudence were fatal. On the third day my mother sickened. Her fever was very malignant, and the looks of her attendants prognosticated the worst event. On her deathbed the fortitude and benignity of this admirable woman did not desert her. She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. My children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place to your younger cousins. Alas, I regret that I am taken from you, and happy and beloved as I have been, is it not hard to quit you all? But these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavor to resign myself cheerfully to death, and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly, and her countenance expressed affection even in death. I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil, the void that presents itself to the soul, and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance. It is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she, whom we saw every day, and whose very existence appeared a part of our own, can have departed for ever, that the brightness of a beloved eye can have been extinguished, and the sound of a voice so familiar and dear to the ear can be hushed, never more to be heard. These are the reflections of the first days. But when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil, then the actual bitterness of grief commences. Yet from whom has not that rude hand rent away some dear connection? And why should I now describe a sorrow which all have felt, and must feel? The time at length arrives when grief is rather an indulgence than a necessity, and the smile that plays upon the lips, although it may be deemed a sacrilege, is not banished. My mother was dead, but we had still duties which we ought to perform. We must continue our course with the rest, and learn to think ourselves fortunate, whilst one remains whom the spoiler has not seized. My journey to Ingolstadt, which had been deferred by these events, was now again determined upon. I obtained from my father a respite of some weeks. This period was spent sadly. My mother's death and my speedy departure depressed our spirits. But Elizabeth endeavored to renew the spirit of cheerfulness in our little society. Since the death of her aunt, her mind had acquired new firmness and vigor. She determined to fulfill her duties with the greatest exactness and she felt that that most imperious day of rendering her uncle and cousins happy had devolved upon her. She consoled me, amused her uncle, instructed my brothers, and I never beheld her so enchanting as at this time, when she was continually endeavoring to contribute to the happiness of others, entirely forgetful of herself. The day of my departure at length arrived. I had taken leave of all my friends excepting Clerval who spent the last evening with us. He bitterly lamented that he was unable to accompany me, but his father could not be persuaded to part with him, intending that he should become a partner with him in business, in compliance with his favorite theory, that learning was superfluous in the commerce of ordinary life. Henry had a refined mind. He had no desire to be idle, and was well pleased to become his father's partner but he believed that a man might be a very good trader and yet possess a cultivated understanding. We sat late, listening to his complaints and making many little arrangements for the future. 
The next morning early I departed. Tears gushed from the eyes of Elizabeth. They proceeded partly from sorrow at my departure and partly because she reflected that the same journey was to have taken place three months before, when a mother's blessing would have accompanied me. I threw myself into the chase that was to convey me away and indulged in the most melancholy reflections. I, who had ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in endeavoring to bestow mutual pleasure. I was now alone. In the university, whither I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. My life had hitherto been remarkably secluded and domestic, and this had given me invincible repugnance to new countenances. I loved my brothers, Elizabeth and Clerval. These were old familiar faces, but I believed myself totally unfitted for the company of strangers. Such were my reflections as I commenced my journey, but as I proceeded, my spirits and hopes rose. I ardently desired the acquisition of knowledge. I had often, when at home, thought it hard to remain during my youth cooped up in one place, and had longed to enter the world, and take my station among other human beings. Now that my desires were complied with, and it would indeed have been folly to repent. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingolstadt, which was long and fatiguing. At length the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment, to spend the evening as I pleased. The next morning I delivered my letters of introduction and paid a visit to some of the principal professors, and among others to M. Kremp, professor of natural philosophy. He received me with politeness, and asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I mentioned, it is true, with fear and trembling, the only authors I had ever read upon those subjects. The professor stared. "'Have you,' he said, "'really spent your time in studying such nonsense?' I replied in the affirmative. "'Every minute,' continued Mr. Kremp with warmth, "'every instant that you have wasted on these books is utterly and entirely lost.' You have burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names. Good God! In what desert land have you lived, where no one was kind enough to inform you that these fancies, which you have so greedily imbibed, are a thousand years old, and as musty as they are ancient? I little expected in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Paracelsus. My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely anew." So saying, he stepped aside and wrote down a list of several books treating of natural philosophy, which he desired me to procure, and dismissed me, after mentioning that in the beginning of the following week he intended to commence a course of lectures upon natural philosophy in its general relations, and that M. Waldman, a fellow professor, would lecture upon chemistry the alternate days that he missed. I returned home, not disappointed for I had long considered those authors useless whom the professor had so strongly reprobated. But I did not feel much inclined to study the books which I procured at his recommendation. M. Kremp was a little squat man with a gruff voice and repulsive countenance. The teacher, therefore, did not prepossess me in favor of his doctrine. Besides, I had a contempt for the uses of modern natural philosophy. It was very different when the masters of the science sought immortality and power. Such views, although futile, were grand. But now the scene was changed. The ambition of the inquirer seemed to limit itself to the annihilation of those visions of which my interest in science was chiefly founded. I was required to exchange chimeras of boundless grandeur for realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during the first two or three days spent almost in solitude. But as the ensuing week commenced, I thought of the information which M. Kremp had given me concerning the lectures. And although I could not consent to go and hear that little conceited fellow deliver sentences out of a pulpit, I recollected what he had said of M. Waldman, whom I had never seen, as he had hitherto been out of town. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, I went into the lecturing room, which M. Waldman entered shortly after. This professor was very unlike his colleague. He appeared about fifty years of age, but with an aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few gray hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. 
His person was short, but remarkably erect, and his voice the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a recapitulation of the history of chemistry and the various improvements made by different men of learning, pronouncing with fervor the names of the most distinguished discoverers. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science and explained many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted, and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers, whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt, and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. I departed highly pleased with the professor and his lecture, and paid him a visit the same evening. His manners in private were even more mild and attractive than in public, for there was a certain dignity in his mien during his lecture, which in his own house was replaced by the greatest affability and kindness. He heard with attention my little narration concerning my studies, and smiled at the names of Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus, but without the contempt that M. Kremp had exhibited. He said that these were men whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers were indebted for most of the foundations of their knowledge. They had left to us, as an easier task, to give new names and arrange in connected classifications the facts which they in a great degree had been the instruments of bringing to light. The laborers of men of genius, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the solid advantage of mankind. I listened to his statement, which was delivered without any presumption or affectation, and then added that his lecture had removed my prejudices against modern chemists, and I, at the same time, requested his advice concerning the books I ought to procure. "'I am happy,' said Mr. Waldman, "'to have gained a disciple, and if your application equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success.' Chemistry is that branch of natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been and may be made. It is on that account that I have made it my peculiar study, but at the same time I have not neglected the other branches of science. A man would make but a very sorry chemist if he attended to that department of human knowledge alone. If your wish is to become really a man of science and not merely a petty experimentalist, I should advise you to apply to every branch of natural philosophy, including mathematics. He then took me into his laboratory and explained to me the uses of his various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure, and promising me the use of his own, when I should have advanced far enough in the science not to derange their mechanism. He also gave me the list of books which I had requested, and I took my leave. Thus ended a day memorable to me. It decided my future destiny.'